All right. Well, sorry I'm not able to be in class with you guys today. Um, got hit pretty hard with the flu here, so hopefully this um, passes quickly and hopefully I'll be back on uh, tomorrow for lab or at least um, Friday for for class. Um, if I'm not able to be in lab, then somebody else will. Um, all right. This is where we ended off last time, um, looking at the uh, pathway of blood flow through the heart. We ended with the slide previous to this, which was the um, the kind of cellular structures of a cardiac myocyte, um, and you can fill in the rest of those structures. And, and then this was just looking at the pathway of blood flow through the heart. So this is really something you can do um, on your own by just go ahead and take a look at figure 17.8. Um, and you can see this is mostly the right side of the heart here. And the next slide is going to be the left side of the heart. And of course, um, both of these things are happening at once. This kind of makes it look like it goes into the right side and then over the lungs and then back to the left side. And then the right side is empty during that period, but that's not really how it works. It's, it's, always, <coughs> it's always full. The heart is always, uh, is always receiving blood on the right side and always uh, ejecting blood on the, on the left side. There's not really a step-by-step -step pattern. Both ventricles contract at the same time, both atria contract at the same time. So you can fill in the rest of these steps here. So, um, and, and uh, to that point, the heart's a two-circuit system. So there's the pulmonary side, which is the lung side, which is the, obviously the heart sending blood to the lungs, and then back to the heart from the lungs. And this side of the heart doesn't produce a lot of pressure, uh, because it doesn't need to, it doesn't have that far to send the blood. Um, it exits, uh, the blood exits the heart via the pulmonary trunk, um, it goes to the pulmonary arteries, and these are the only arteries in the body that uh, carry deoxygenated blood. Um, they're arteries because they're going away from the heart, um, but they're going to the lungs to get filled up with, with oxygen. Um, so it goes from those pulmonary arteries all the way down to these little tiny capillaries in the lungs that we'll look at later. That's when oxygen is able to be loaded onto the blood and CO2 is loaded off to go back in the lungs to breathe out. Um, and then they go, they connect from those capillaries in the lungs back to the pulmonary veins, um, back to the left atrium. And then we're on the systemic circuit. And this is obviously from the heart to the body and then back to the heart. Very high pressure, much further to go, uh, much more gravity to deal with. We gotta get blood all the way back from the feet, back up to the back into the heart. And so here it's exiting out the left ventricle through the aorta to arteries to capillaries to veins back to vena cava and and then to the coronary sinus um, and the right atrium. So that's pretty much it for the, these notes and I'm going to uh, jump right into the next set of notes which is the electrical properties. So electrical properties of the heart we're going to be looking at the way um, some different heart cells um, have action potentials. The way that looks a little bit different than skeletal muscle action potentials as well as, uh, as neuron action potentials. It all looks a little bit different and we'll be looking at some of those differences here. So just as a review, um, this is the same slide as what I had last semester. Skeletal muscle action potential review. Uh, what causes an action potential? Well, first of all, we've got the four states of the action potential, four phases, resting, depolarization there, number two, uh, number three, repolarization, number four, hyperpolarization. Okay, and so what's really causing the action potential is when the cell membrane um, permeability changes to different ions. Pretty much that just means allowing um, different ions to flow either in or out of the cell. And... Uh, yeah, as we talked about um, last semester, just as we can review now, this first phase here, step two, depolarization, is caused by an influx of sodium, and you can see sodium permeability goes up. Second phase, or really phase three, is uh, repolarization, which is caused by increase in potassium permeability, but in this case, potassium flows um, out of the cell. <clears throat> and then number four is hyperpolarization, where it's still potassium leaving the cell that causes that extra hyperpolarization, and then it slowly gets its way back to resting membrane potential. So, um, this is really this these changes in permeability are really dictated by the voltage gated ion channels that we talked a lot about last semester. 
Um, and so at one point can another action potential occur? Well, once we've um, deep, once we've repolarized, and once the so that sodium gate has reset, remember the sodium channel that has the inactivation gate and the activation gate, that has to completely reset before we can um, have another action potential. And that happens somewhere in here, somewhere in repolarization and hyperpolarization. So, a um, little bit about the sliding filament theory. We talked all about this last semester. Um, this is just a quick review. Um, the length of an action potential and the refractory period together with skeletal muscle is only about one to two milliseconds. So very, very short. Um, if we just do one single twitch of muscle, it's about 20 to 100 milliseconds. Okay, so, so pretty quick. Um, but then again, many action potentials happen to, uh, during one twitch to allow tetanus. So the key there is very, very short action potential, uh, one to two milliseconds. Okay, and so cardiac action potentials are very different than um, skeletal muscle action potentials. They start in these cells called pacemaker cells. We'll talk more about those later. Um, the SA node, which is the sinoatrial node, and the AV node, which is the atrial ventricular node, these are two little collections of cells um, in the heart that, uh, that are pacemaker cells. They set the pace of the heart and they depolarize on their own without any um, help from the nervous system. So this action potential, once it's started by these pacemaker cells, is going to pass through gap junctions from cell to cell. We talked about that quite a bit. Um, and then again, resting membrane potential of a cardiac action potential is going to be pretty much the same. It's going to be negative on the inside. On the inside, we have lots of potassium. Outside, we have lots of sodium, just like a skeletal muscle cell or just like a neuron. Depolarization in cardiac action potentials is going to be caused by sodium rushing in, just like in skeletal muscle. But then here's where the difference comes in. In cardiac action potential, we have this long plateau phase, and that's caused by slow calcium channels opening and calcium rushing in. That keeps the cell depolarized um, for a long period of time. And then repolarization again is the same, uh, same way, same, uh, yeah, same cause of repolarization as we get uh, with skeletal muscle. It's that um, efflux or uh, potassium leaving the cell. Okay, so with cardiac action potential here, um, <clears throat> looks a lot different. Okay, number one thing you'll notice: remember we said the skeletal muscle action potential was one to two milliseconds. That would only be about right here. It would, it would just be. A, Flip on this screen, on this line. See this this x-axis goes all the way to 300 milliseconds. Okay, so much much longer. Again, number one is caused by depolarization. Uh, that depolarization is caused by sodium influx, just like in skeletal muscle. Number two, that plateau phase is caused by calcium influx, um, which is very different. And then number three, it's still caused by by a. Uh, by well, number one, stopping that calcium influx and then allowing potassium to leave the cell. And that's what we see for repolarization. So very similar except for step number two there, which is the plateau phase caused by calcium coming into the cell. So how long does it last? It's about 250 milliseconds. And this is really the whole contraction of the, of the heart. And this is so important because um, we really don't want tetanic contractions in the heart. We don't want long, sustained contractions in the heart. We don't want our heart to produce force and just hold on to that force. We actually want our heart to contract all those muscle cells at once, pump a bunch of blood out, and then relax quickly so it can fill up again. Okay, so we don't want sustained um, force in, in the heart. So that, that plateau really helps with that. Okay, and so if you put those <coughs> the action potential of the skeletal muscle fiber cell, or skeletal muscle fiber, fiber on the same x-axis as we had for the cardiac action potential, we see um, a very, very different um, duration, right? This is the one to two milliseconds, almost nothing on here, compared to this um, closer to 300 milliseconds. Okay, so this is a good clicker question here. Why is tension in the heart muscle increasing during the plateau phase of the cardiac action potential? Uh, and uh, yeah, think about this for a sec here. And, um, and one thing that's really important to notice is that uh, um, B there, the tension is building um, as, as uh, yeah, sorry, uh, not, not B, but, but, uh, but in D there, the tension is building uh, 
as the as that plateau phase goes on and that tension is building during the same time that calcium is going into the cell so D is the is the correct answer here um, and uh, yeah and so we'll, we'll on, this, on this next slide here we'll talk about a little bit more here in a sec so <clears throat> Action potential um, reaches the sarcoplasm curriculum. Um, calcium released into the muscle fiber via, via sarcoplasm curriculum. That's all normal, just like when we contract a uh, skeletal muscle cell, we get that those T tubules get an action potential going down them that causes calcium release. Same thing in, in cardiac myocytes, but the difference here is this: sarcoplasm curriculum enters each sarcomere only once instead of twice. And the sarcoplasm reticulum doesn't release as much calcium as it in the in the heart cells as it does in skeletal muscle cells. So we actually would need to rely on about 10 to 20 percent of the calcium to come from the outside of the cell. Okay, and then the most important part about this that connects it back to the tension is why do we need calcium for contraction? Right. So calcium does one job in coming in and, and keeping the membrane depolarized. That's its first job, because a positively charged ion coming into the cell is going to keep it depolarized. But then its second job is it goes in there and it has something to bind to, right? So it binds to troponin, just like it did in skeletal muscle. And when it binds to troponin, the more troponin it binds to, um, that opens up the binding site for actin and myosin. And then um, that myosin head can attach to actin. And that's why tension is building when calcium is flowing in is because the more calcium flow in we have, the more it binds the troponin, which means the more myosin heads are now attaching to actin, and the more force we get out of that contraction. And everything else is, is the same uh, between uh, cardiac ac ex excitation, contraction, coupling, and skeletal muscle. Okay, so the conduction pathway, we've got kind of uh, five different steps here. Okay, the sinoatrial node is found in the upper right part of the atrium, right by the vena cava. Um, its function is to be the pacemaker of the heart. Okay, it causes atrial contraction. Okay, so that's the first step. Second step, after the SA node fires, it's going to con contract the, the exponential is going to be sent down the, the atria on both sides, the right and the left atria, and then it's going to make its way to the atrioventricular node, or the AV node. That's found right next to the tricuspid valve. So right there on the again, on the right side of the heart, between right between the, the right atrium and the right ventricle. Okay, its function is again to receive stimulus from the atria and then send that signal to the ventricles. Okay, there's a slight pause that happens here because we don't want the the uh, the ventricles to contract immediately um, at the same time as the atria because we want a little time for the, to allow that last atrial contraction to um, fill up the heart the rest of the way. And so there's a little bit of pause caused by the AV node, which allows for the heart to fill, um, and then it's going to send the signal down. Next stop is what's called the AV bundle. This is in the superior interventricular septum, so the top part of the of the dividing line between the two ventricles. The function of this is really the, this is the only connection between the two ventricles, um, and so this carries a signal out to both sides of the heart on the, on the ventricles. Okay, so the then next it goes what's called the bundle branches. So this is again in the interventricular septum, but there's one branch on each side, uh, right and left. And then finally, down to the Purkinje fibers, and the, and the location of these is all throughout the ventricles as well as the papillary muscles, and the function of these is to contract ventricles and papillary muscles. And these, these depolarize extremely fast, a um, hundred times faster than the rest. Okay, so that's the last step goes around those Purkinje fibers and it's going to cause contraction of the whole body. So, so you can go ahead and fill this in here. Um, the, the deal with this is here we've got number one, which is going to be, again, the SA node, right, sinoatrial node. That's going to contract, send the signal to both, both atria, right, contracts the right atria, atrium, contracts the left atrium, okay, and then we'll see. Um, next step is the AV node, the atrioventricular node. It's going to receive the signal from the SA node. Um, it's going to fire the SA node, and then it goes down to the next part, which is the AV bundle, right? That's in that superior part of the septum. Uh, and then it splits into two to the bundle branches, one on the right side, one on the left side. And then you can see immediately we get into what are known as the Purkinje 
fibers that are also known as the subendocardial conducting network. And this is where that signal travels really fast, so it wraps around the heart, contracts all of that muscle just in time to, to get the ventricles to contract all, uh, all together. And that's really the way this conduction system works. Okay, um, <clears throat> so if we put all of those different action potentials together, we're going to look at this pacemaker action potential here in a sec, but this is what the SA node and the AV node looks like as far as the action potential goes. Okay, so number one is the is the SA node um, action potential. Number two is going to be when the atrial muscle contracts, so it looks a little bit more like a like a cardiac action potential there with the plateau, but not quite as long of a plateau. Number three is going to be the AV node. Again, we've got that distinct just kind of bump that is part of the um, pacemaker cell um, potential. And we see that in the AV node. And then lastly, all those cells of the ventricle. Um, we see that nice long plateau, which allows us um, allows uh, for, for all that extra calcium influx to get more tension. Also allows the rest of the heart cells to kind of catch up and for all those to contract at once. So ventricular depolarization was obviously this one here. Okay, so a little bit more about these autorhythmic cells. The autorhythmic cells um, are non-contractile muscle cells. They're, they look just like cardiac muscle cells, except they don't contract. They're there just to um, set the pace of, of heart contractions and to carry those action potentials. So again, we've got them in two places, um, really three places, um, SA node, AV node, and then a little bit in the AV bundle. Okay, Action potential is going to start on its own in these cells. And, and so um, for those of you that have seen uh, the old Indiana Jones movie, or maybe those of you that played uh, um, Mortal Kombat, like I did, um, uh, as, as an old video game. There's a, in both of those <laughs> story, in both of those cases, there's a there's a thing where somebody gets their heart ripped out of their chest, right? And then and it's actually beating in there in the person's hand that rips it out. And there's a little bit of truth to that. Um, the heart would actually beat a little bit by itself um, for a little while for a matter of seconds before it died because of not having oxygen, but it would beat a little bit by itself. And that's kind of what you see in Indiana Jones. So, um, <clears throat> so and one thing that's, uh, a couple things that are unique about these autorhythmic cells, again, action potential be begins on its own, doesn't need stimulation from the nervous system. There's no resting membrane potential between, um, between action potentials. It just goes down and it comes back up. Hyperpolarization that we see between action potentials is going to lead to closing of potassium gates, and then that immediately opens sodium gates. So just like in the skeletal muscles, uh, action potential, we see the closing of uh, potassium channels with hyperpolarization, but that, that doesn't also lead to opening of sodium gates, but in, in these autorhythmic cells it does. So we get the slow influx of sodium, which is, which is causing depolarization, but then once it hits the threshold, about negative 40 millivolts, an action potential occurs via calcium influx. So different, different situation than any of the other action potentials we've talked about. So we get slow influx of sodium, hit the threshold, and then, and then rapid influx of uh, calcium. And then again, repolarization occurs via open um, potassium channels, uh, and potassium exits the cell, as well as uh, calcium stopping uh, its influx. So that here on the next uh, page. So, so number one is going to be that slow depolarization, and that's going to be caused by that sodium influx, right? That slow, slow, that slow sodium influx. Okay, so we see that. See that here. Number one, slow sodium influx. Number two is going to be once we hit the threshold, then we switch over to calcium influx. Right. So number two is fast depolarization due to calcium influx. Um, and then number three, um, that repolarization, just like in the other cells, is going to be caused by potassium exiting the cells. And you can see there's no really resting membrane potential afterwards. As soon as those potassium channels close, sodium channels open, and we start getting the slow leakage of sodium again. Okay. So there's another good uh, comprehension question here. If the AV node, SA node, and AV bundle are all autorhythmic, then why is the SA node the, actual, the one that actually sets the pace of the heart? Um, and so you can think about that for a second. Um, and really what it comes down to is it's 
it depolarizes faster than the other two. It's, uh, and, and so it's going as the other two groups are starting to depolarize, the action potential is already making its way down towards them from the SA node, and so that leads to the, the rest of the depolarization. Um, and so the the, AV, or the SA node actually depolarizes um, at a rate of about 100 beats per minute. And so what this means is, um, we, we all know that our resting heart rate is lower than 100 beats per minute. That's usually on anywhere for, for you guys, probably between 40 mid-40s to the mid-60s. Um, for older people, maybe up closer to 80. But still, in all of those cases, it actually takes active control of the heart to slow it down. And so we have neurons from the vagus nerve, which we'll talk more about next time, that are um, causing the, the SA node to actually slow down its depolarization. And, and so during resting heart rate, we, it takes active control to slow down um, the SA node. So C is the correct answer. Okay, so when we look at um, the electrical activity of the heart, all of you, most likely, in some case, if you're going into a health profession, will will run across a, an EKG or an ECG um, at some point in your career. And so this stands for electrocardiogram. The C is more the English way to say it. The K is uh, the German way to say it, which is where the technology was developed, was in Germany. Cardio in, in German is with a K, and that's why it's EKG. Um, so what is it measuring? It's measuring voltage and we talked about voltage last semester and the definition for voltage is really just a, a charge difference between two locations okay and so that's what that's what this is doing so when you look at um, all these different leads on this person's body you got one here um, you, you got it's called a 12 lead EKG um, but really what each strip does each each strip like this looks a little bit different depending on which two electrodes you're using but one strip would be using this electrode versus this electrode. And as long as it crosses over the heart, it can pick up a charge difference between one, one pad and the other. Okay? Um, and this is used to detect abnormal heart rhythms as well as a heart attack. Uh, it can be seen here. Um, very important in, in cardiology to, uh, to be familiar with the EKG. Okay, so the names uh, of the waves are given here. So the P wave is what represents atrial depolarization. Okay, so that's first, and then there's a little bit of time um, between the, the start of the P wave and the R wave, and that's really going to be that kind of the active filling time of the heart. Okay, so, so the QRS complex, which is this, QRS, this is going to be ventricular depolarization. That's really when the ventricles are contracting. Okay, and then we have this next phase called the ST segment. That's between the S wave and the T. Um, and, and then we get to the, to the T wave, which is when the ventricles are repolarizing. Okay, um, ST segment elevation is the most common sign of, of someone having a heart attack. Um, and so if that ST line was to rise up, um, then that would be a sign of, of, of a, at least lack of blood flow to part of the heart. Um, yeah, so you definitely just need to know those, know the, be able to label the EKG as well as uh, knowing what they, what each wave represents. Okay, so um, these next slides are, are activities that I, I really like doing in class. Um, so I'm bummed we don't get to do it in person together, um, but I want you to just take some time and kind of work through this. Um, and. Uh, and yeah, so really what you're doing is you're, is you're trying to order um, the events, starting with passive ventric ventricular filling, and I change that on your, on your PDF. It, it says atrial filling, <coughs> but actually passive ventricular filling is where I want you to start, um, and ending in relaxation after ventricular contraction. So I'll help you get started here. Um, and so the, if we're talking about passive ventricular filling, the first stage where the ventricles are actually filling is going to be right here in C, right? Because the atria were full, the pressure in the ventricles died down enough to where the pressure in the ventricles was lower than the pressure in the atria, and that's what caused the, um, the AV valves to open, right? This tricuspid and the bicuspid, that caused them to open. So C is first, right? So it's going to be passive filling, the first stage of passive filling of the ventricles. Okay, and then uh, before we actually get to um, contracting the atria, we have one more stage over here, which is A, 
which is when we're, we're filling up the ventricles all the way, almost. Okay, so go from C to A. This is kind of the end, the last filling of the ventricles. Okay, and then we're going to get the we're going to get the atria to contract. So these little black lines represent contraction. So we get the we get the atria to contract. This is called the atrial kick. It's just the last bit of filling we get in the ventricles. Okay, um, so that fills up the ventricles completely. And now the ventricles are full. Now we need to get ventricular contraction, right? And there's two different ones here that. Uh, that show ventricular contraction. One, the blood is exiting the vessels. One, it's not yet, right? So the first step is going to be E when we're, um, this is called the isovolumetric contraction phase. Okay, so where the ventricles are starting to contract and that's what closes the AV valves, right? So those AV valves are closed now and pressure's building, but it's not high enough yet to be higher than the pressure on the other side of these semilunar valves. Okay, so it's building, building, but no no blood is leaving. That's why it's called isovolumetric. The volume is staying the same, even though the heart's contracting. And then, finally, enough tension is produced to open up these semilunar valves. Blood starts exiting the heart. You can see that we're already starting to fill the, the atria for the next round of contraction. Okay, so that's D is next. And then, finally, last step would be B, when there's still some pressure in the left ventricle, still more pressure than there is in the, in the atria. Um, and so the atria are filling, and, this, and the AV valves haven't opened up yet. So <clears throat> that's the order. Let me, let me uh, run you through it one more time. So the order is going to be first C, second to A, third F with the atrial contraction, fourth is going to be E, isovolumetric contraction of the ventricles. Um, next is going to be D which is going to be contraction and blood exiting the heart. And then lastly, it's going to be B, when those semilunar valves have closed. Um, blood is filling the atria, but those AV valves haven't opened up yet. Okay, and then you would just start right back over again at C. Okay, so you're going to have to work through that, spend some time on that to really understand that. It's a very important aspect of, uh, of understanding the heart. Okay, so now this is another thing that I like you to be able to do, which is, which is figure out in each of these steps, when do the AV valves close? When do they open? When do the semilunar valves close? When do they open, right? And then those other questions there too, where does the P wave occur? Where does the QRS complex occur? And where does the T wave occur? Okay, so let's start with the, with the AV valves closing, right? So these, this will be the tricuspid and the bicuspid. As we talked about, the cause of closure of the AV valves is contraction of the ventricles, right? So the first place that the ventricles contract is right here, right? It's during this isovolumetric contraction phase. So we get contraction of those ventricles that slaps the, or kind of snaps the AV valve shut. All right, so E is where the AV valves close. When did the AV valves open? Okay, so that's gonna be between B and C, right? We talked about how B was after ventricular contraction, but the blood's still pooling in the atria. And then when the enough pressure builds up in the atria, enough pressure dies down in the ventricles, that opens up the AV valves and that fills the ventricles. So C is where the AV valves open. <clears throat> okay, semilunar valves. When do they close? They close right after D, right? D is the is the ejection phase, the ventricular ejection phase. That's when blood is exiting the heart. Okay, and then right over from D to B is that blood is, as soon as that pressure in the ventricles dies down enough, to where it's actually lower pressure than what we have in the aorta and the pulmonary artery, then blood's going to start rushing backwards and that snaps the semilunar valve shut so we don't get backflow of blood into the heart. So B is where they close. Okay, and then finally, where do the semilunar valves open? This is going to be, um, again, we have isovolumetric contraction, which is they're still closed, but then the contraction phase where they build up enough pressure to open up those um, semilunar valves is right here. And so D is where they open. Okay, P wave is going to align with atrial contraction. That's going to be F. QRS complex is going to be with ventricle contraction. So there's really two phases where we see that, both E and D. And then the T wave is going to be right after D, whichever one comes after D, which again is B. And that's going to be um, when we when we see the repolarization of the ventricles. One thing I forgot to note on EKG is there is repolarization of the atria as well but we just don't see that because it's happening during the QRS complex. And that QRS complex is such, such more of a radical uh, change in voltage 
that it completely hides the, the repolarization of the atria. Okay. Lastly, um, I don't know if the sound is working there for you guys, um, but uh, what I like doing this slide in class. Let me turn it up so you can... Yeah, there you go. Hopefully you can hear it. Um, but I have the heart sounds in the back of this slide here. Um, and again, I want you to kind of think about um, where we hear those heart sounds. Okay? And we already said that the first sound what we call lub. Lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. That first sound that we call lub is due to the AV valve snapping shut and then blood hitting against the back of the valves. And we already talked about where the AV valves close, so you can figure out where that lub sound would be happening in those options above. And then the second sound, that dub, is again due to the semilunar valves closing. So again, that's after ventricular contraction, um, when after we eject blood, and then blood starts coming back, and it's going to close um, the semilunar valves. So um, yeah, so that's that's kind of uh, it there for the heart sounds. Um, the one thing that we one thing that we uh, typically note on this on this part is that most abnormal heart sounds, uh, like uh, regurgitation and murmurs and things like that, most of those are due to the valves not quite working properly. Uh, so a little bit of blood squirting back through, uh, a little bit of the valve being too stiff, things like that. That's really what causes those different uh, those abnormal heart sounds.